Mr. Speaker, sir, I beg to move that Parliament approves the financial policy of the government for the financial year from 1st April 2018 to 31st March 21st April 2019 to 31st March 2020. This year marks 200 years since the Stanford Raffles landed in Singapore. Archaeological finds and records show that Singapore's history stretches back at least 700 years, serving as a trading emporium in the region. 19, 1819 was a key turning point in Singapore's development. The British decision to declare Singapore a free port plucked us into an emerging network of global trade. This and subsequent developments transformed Singapore into a global node. In our bicentennial year, let us reflect on the twists and turns in our history so as to chart a path forward for an even better future for our people. Today, we are in a different phase of globalization with new forces reshaping the global environment. In last year's budget statement, I mentioned three major shifts. The shift in global economic weight towards Asia, rapid technological advancements, and changing demographic patterns. A fourth major force that is gaining prominence is the decline in support for globalization. Some countries are benefiting from globalization, while others are questioning its value. These four major forces are interacting in complex ways at the global, regional, and national levels. On the global stage, the trade frictions between the US and China are developing into a deeper strategic competition of strength and of governance systems. This is raising geopolitical uncertainty. Closer to home, ASEAN has enjoyed over 50 years of peace and stability with bright economic prospects. Together, the 10 economies of ASEAN are projected to become the fourth largest in the world by 2030, with the size of the middle class doubling. Innovation and entrepreneurship are also thriving. In recent years, Southeast Asia has grown several new unicorns or companies with valuations in excess of 1 billion US dollars. Working together, ASEAN nations can maximize our potential. But closely connected neighbors will have occasional differences. A couple of issues have surfaced recently with Malaysia. When such differences occur, Singaporeans must stay united as a people and present our positions firmly and calmly. We have worked through difficult bilateral issues with our neighbors in the past based on mutual respect and common interest, and in accordance with international laws and norms. Singapore will continue to seek to resolve issues in the same spirit. Domestically, we need to address longer-term challenges, including ageing, social mobility and inequality, economic transformation and climate change. The changing global and domestic landscape presents both challenges and opportunities. We will continue to chart our way forward confidently in the Singapore way, building on our distinct strengths and our Singaporean DNA. We must respond to challenges with grit and determination. There were episodes in the centuries of Singapore's history where our island's fortunes waned due to external forces. These are sobering reminders that we have to constantly build up our security and resilience and plan long term. Singapore's success has roots in our port, which thrives on openness and connectivity. These traits have been forged into our identity as a people. As a multicultural society, our openness to diversity is our strength. It has inculcated a global mindset and deepened our knowledge of Asia we must continue to cultivate cross-cultural literacy among our youths and encourage them to build bridges with people across the world. We strive to be a place where people and ideas congregate at the frontiers of global development. We want to be a global Asia node of technology, 
innovation and enterprise. We turn our size and strategic location into an advantage. Technological shifts have spread economic activities more widely and at the same time made cities more important as key nodes of enterprise and innovation. As a city-state, we are nimbler and can adapt to changes faster. We serve as a neutral, trusted node in key spheres of global activity. Like Sun Kan Chiu, the small but quick-witted mouse deer, we can make our way in the world. Budget 2019 is a strategic plan to allocate resources to build a strong, united Singapore. In this bicentennial year, let us draw on our strengths and our Singaporean DNA, openness, multiculturalism, and self-determination to continue to progress. At a fundamental level, we must keep Singapore safe and secure. This allows us to preserve our way of life and forge our own destiny. We must continue to transform our economy, for only a vibrant and innovative economy can provide opportunities for our people to realise their potential. We must continue to build a caring and inclusive society where we look out for one another and all of us play our part in weaving a tightly knit social fabric. And we must continue to build Singapore as a global city and home for all, keeping it smart, sustainable and globally connected. Last but not least, we must achieve these goals in a responsible and fiscally sustainable way. We are using our financial resources to help realise our strategies for a strong, united Singapore. But financial resources alone do not get us there. We call on all Singaporeans to partner with the government and support one another to succeed in this endeavour. A safe and secure Singapore gives us the confidence to chart an independent course. But we cannot take our peace, prosperity and stability for granted. Singapore is vulnerable to the fluctuations in our region and the world against an increasingly uncertain geopolitical environment our commitments to defence and security cannot waver. Diplomacy and deterrence are the twin pillars of our approach. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs works continuously to build good relations with our neighbours and the major powers and to promote rules-based international order with international laws and norms. A strong SAF lends weight to our diplomatic efforts and ensures that negotiations with Singapore are taken seriously. Should diplomacy fail, we must stand ready to safeguard our interests and defend ourselves. The Home Team also works round the clock alongside other security agencies to ensure a safe environment for all. We now have the Cyber Security Agency of Singapore leading our efforts to protect our critical information infrastructure from cyber threats and to create a secure cyberspace for businesses and communities. These are fundamental to our sovereignty, our success, and to safeguarding our vital interests. Singapore is one of the safest cities in the world. Our crime rates are consistently low, but we must not be complacent. Security threats are evolving and becoming more complex. A strong SAF remains a bulwark against threats to our way of life. Terrorism threats to Singapore remain high. We continue to detect individuals in Singapore who have been radicalised by terrorist propaganda. Globally, we see a rise in attacks perpetrated by radicalised individuals and cells. Such attacks are hard to prevent. We must stay vigilant. Beyond fiscal threats, malicious cyber activities are growing. The network nature of our society has enhanced connectivity, but this can be exploited to disrupt and divide society through cyber attacks, the spread of falsehoods or other means. In particular, foreign actors 
will try to influence our domestic affairs and politics. This is not new, but new technologies have made it easier for others to mount attacks and with greater ease and intensity and with more sophisticated tactics. To stay ahead of these threats, we must continue to innovate and build new capabilities to meet our security needs. Both the public and private sectors have a major role to play. The Ministry of Home Affairs will set up a home team <coughs> science and technology agency by the end of this year to develop science and technology capabilities to support the home team's operational needs. These capabilities will strengthen the home team's ability to carry out its mission of safeguarding Singapore. The Minister for Home Affairs will speak more about this at the Committee of Supply. The private security industry has been stepping up efforts. A good example is CERTIS, which has redesigned its business processes, infusing technologies such as big data and artificial intelligence to deal with security threats. MHA will help to transform the private security industry through innovation and technology to meet growing needs and be an effective partner to the home team. Our total defence approach <coughs> will continue to keep Singapore safe and secure, with every Singaporean playing a part. At the national level, we plan long term and take measures such as stockpiling critical supplies, diversifying our sources of water supply, and strengthening our food security. As a people, <coughs> we must have the psychological and emotional resilience to face crises stoically. As threats get more sophisticated, Singaporeans must stay vigilant <coughs> and guard against non-conventional forces that threaten to divide us. National Service has forged a deep understanding in our people <coughs> that each and every one of us has a duty to defend our nation. When our young people serve NS, families and employers support them in every way possible. With our smart nation drive, digital technology has become an integral part of our lives. To harness the digital advantage, we must be prepared to also deal with the threats that arise inevitably from its more pervasive use. Digital defence has now been incorporated as the sixth pillar of total defence. Like the other pillars of total defence, digital defence involves everyone, individuals, community groups, businesses and the government. We must all play our part to be secure, alert and responsible online, be it through practicing good cyber hygiene, being vigilant against fake news, and helping one another, another use technology safely. Last year, MINDEF launched the Cyber National Servicemen Scheme, training national servicemen with the Singapore Institute of Technology to raise our cyber defense capability. The government is also engaging our tech community with programs such as the Government Bug Bounty Program to achieve a higher level of collective cyber security. Given its strategic significance, the government will continue to invest a significant share of our resources, about 30% of our total expenditure this year, to support our defence, security and diplomacy efforts. This spending is significant, but indispensable. We will invest more if the need arises to protect the sovereignty of Singapore and the well-being of Singaporeans. Everyone has a role to play to keep Singapore safe and secure. Let us continue to stay united in defending our home and our way of life. A vibrant and innovative economy provides our people with the opportunities to realise their potential and to have a better life. Our efforts to transform our economy are bearing fruit. In, in tandem with the global expansion, the Singapore economy grew 3.2% in 2018. Good growth is translated into good outcomes for our workers. Over the past five years, the real median income of Singaporeans has grown by 3.6% per year. 
Global growth is expected to moderate in 2019, while uncertainties and downside risks in the global economy have increased. Over the years, our sound monetary and fiscal policies have enabled us to weather global economic crisis and keep inflation stable. This provides a stable environment for investors to make long-term investment decisions. Beyond maintaining a supportive macroeconomic environment, we need to build a sound microeconomic foundation so that resources can be allocated to their best possible uses and to undertake structural reforms to enable our workers and firms to adapt and stay competitive. Every firm and every worker will need to work differently, master new skills and use technology well. And we must continue to create new opportunities, including through partnerships with others. In Budget 2016, we launched the Industry Transformation Maps, or ITMs, which drive transformation at a company, industry, and economy-wide levels. Each ITM integrates four key pillars of transformation, jobs and skills, innovation, internationalization, and productivity. These are mutually reinforcing pillars to maximize impact. To coordinate efforts, the Future Economy Council brings together leaders from the government, industry, trade associations and chambers, unions and academia. After three years of intensive work, I'm glad that all 23 ITMs have been launched, covering about 80% of our economy. We're seeing good progress, aided by the global economy upturn in recent years. Productivity, as measured by real value added per actual hour worked, grew 3.6% per year in the last three years, higher than the 1.6% per annum growth recorded in the preceding three years from 2012 to 2015. In particular, we have seen strong performance by outward-oriented sectors such as manufacturing, while others like construction and some services industries continue to show weaker productivity growth. But this is a continuing journey. <clears throat> There's much more we can do, especially in sectors like domestic services. We must press on. Let me now outline three key thrusts in this budget to support industry transformation. First, building deep enterprise capabilities. Second, building deep worker capabilities. Third, encouraging strong partnerships within Singapore and across the world. The basic building blocks of a vibrant economy are strong, competitive companies that maximize value creation. Hence, the first thrust is to support the building of deep enterprise capabilities. Companies at different stages of growth have different needs. The leadership of each company is in the best position to lead and drive changes, while our agencies can provide support at each stage of growth. A vibrant startup ecosystem encourages budding entrepreneurs to try out their business ideas. Such an ecosystem enables entrepreneurs to connect to mentors, prospective business partners, customers, and investors. Two years ago, we launched Startup SG to provide holistic support for startups and entrepreneurs. Such a support ranges from co-investments and proof of concept grants to mentorship and fiscal space. Our startup ecosystem is flourishing there are now over 220 venture capital deals per year in Singapore, worth close to 4.2 billion US dollars. This is a significant rise from the 80 deals worth US 136 million in 2012. Today, more than 150 global venture capital funds, incubators and accelerators are based in Singapore, supporting startups here and in the region. Startups can only thrive if they scale up and venture into new markets. To help them do so, we'll provide support in three areas, providing customized assistance, better financing options, 
and supporting technology adoption. Customized support can enable firms to identify and overcome the unique challenges they face and scale up quickly. Enterprise Singapore will launch a Scale Up SG program in partnership with the private and public sectors. Scale Up SG will work with aspiring high growth local firms to identify and build new capabilities to innovate, grow and internationalize. To support innovation, we'll launch a pilot innovation agents program for firms to tap on a pool of experts to advise them on opportunities to innovate and commercialize technology. Having smart patient capital that attracts investors with the expertise and the right time horizon is another way to help firms scale up. Over the past few years, the government has worked on improving access to private capital for startups and SMEs. The pool of private equity and venture capital managers in Singapore has grown. The Monetary Authority of Singapore has simplified the regulatory regime for venture capital managers and launched a US $5 billion private markets program to encourage global private equity players to deepen their presence here. To further deepen the pool of smart patient capital, the government has, since 2010, set aside $400 million through two rounds of fund injections for the co-investment program to invest in our SMEs alongside the private sector. So far, the government's investments have catalyzed approximately $1.3 billion of additional funding for our SMEs. This year, I will set aside an additional $100 million to establish SME Co-Investment Fund 3. As part of this co-investment fund, it will catalyze investment in Singapore-based SMEs that are ready to scale up. We expect that this will bring in at least $200 million of additional funding. Loan financing remains an important source of funding for SMEs. Our banks have been responding. DBS provides a business capabilities loan for innovative SME projects. UOB provides financial support for technology investments and overseas ventures, while OCBC finances new SMEs which lack the track record typically required for credit assessment. To catalyze this further, we will enhance the accessibility of loans. Today, our economic agencies have different financing schemes. To make it simpler for companies, we will streamline the existing financing schemes offered by Enterprise Singapore into a single enterprise financing scheme that will cover trade, working capital, fixed assets, venture debt, mergers and acquisitions, and project financing. This will be launched in October this year. In addition, the enterprise financing scheme will provide stronger support for companies that have been incorporated for less than five years. The government will take up to 70% of the risk for bank loans to these young companies, compared to the current 50% under most existing loan scheme. To support viable SMEs in their day-to-day -day operations, I will extend the SME Working Capital Loan Scheme for about two more years, to March 2021. Since its launch in June 2016, the scheme has catalyzed more than $2.5 billion of loans. We expect the extension to catalyze a further $1.8 billion. Support for the working capital will be forwarded under the Enterprise Financing Scheme from October. Our companies and workers must stay on top of rapid advances in technology, especially in digital technology. We will continue to help our SMEs adopt digital technologies. We adopt the SMEs Go Digital program in Budget 2017. Since then, around 4,000 SMEs have adopted pre-approved digital solutions. We will expand SMEs Go Digital program. First, accountancy, CE transport and construction will get their own industry digital plans, with more sectors to be added later. 
This will guide SMEs on relevant digital technologies and skills training programs. Second, we will expand the number and range of cost-effective pre-approved digital solutions that will be supported under the SMEs Go Digital to boost technology adoption among SMEs. MAS and IMDA will also jointly pilot a cross-border innovation platform for SMEs known as the Business Sun's Borders with an artificial intelligence-enabled marketplace to help our SMEs match with buyers and vendors globally. To help companies in the services sector capture opportunities from digitalization, the Ministry of Comms and Information launched a pilot of the Digital Services Lab, or DSL, in November last year. The DSL brings together industry and the research community to co-develop digital solutions with sector-wide impact. For example, the DSL is exploring the development of solutions to integrate the logistics chain in malls. Besides digital technology, we'll support our firms to integrate technologies and re-engineer business processes to raise efficiency and enhance product development. Last year, I announced the Productivity Solutions Grant to help firms adopt off-the-shelf technology. This year, we will extend the automation support package by two years. Introduced in Budget 2016, the automation support package supports firms to deploy impactful, large-scale automation, such as robotics, Internet of Things solutions, and other Industry 4.0 technologies. Since its launch, the ASP has helped more than 300 companies to automate their operations and raise productivity. We will extend the ASP to encourage more companies to do so. The Agency for Science, Technology and Research will extend its operation and technology road mapping efforts to more companies and sectors to guide them to make the best use of technology in alignment with their business goals. In the same spirit, our government agencies must embrace technology to serve companies better. We have made progress in this area. The Business Grants Portal, launched in 2017, provides a one-stop shop for businesses to identify and apply for the right grants for their plans. To make it easier for businesses to transact with the government, the Ministry of Trade and Industry and relevant agencies are developing a one-stop portal with a pilot to be launched for the food services sector by 3Q2019. Businesses will deal with only one point of contact instead of up to the 14 different ones today. BCA and HDB are also testing the use of drones to inspect building facades more effectively. Learning from these pilots, government agencies will continue to innovate and improve the ease of doing business. Let me now touch on other ways to help build deep enterprise capabilities. We have more than 200,000 enterprises in Singapore, ranging from large MNCs to our neighbourhood shops. Today, across each of the four pillars of our ITMs, different agencies provide support in each area. While helpful, companies have given feedback that we could streamline this. <coughs> I agree. To better support this broad base of companies with diverse needs, We'll draw resources from each agency, but focus support in an enterprise-centric way to better help enterprises at each stage of growth. This will be done in a tiered manner. Firms with large and complex needs or with strong growth potential will be provided a range of customized support by EDB and ESG and other agencies. The large number of SMEs facing common challenges will be supported through scalable solutions that are easy to adopt. For instance, I recently visited Precursor Assurance, a local accounting firm. Precursor has developed an integrated digital solution with modules for corporate functions such as HR, customer relationship management and finance. SMEs can simply plug and play and scale up the use of these modules when they expand. 
For medium-sized companies that are seeking to grow, we'll provide targeted support in each of the different industry clusters to better address their needs as they grow. The Minister for Trade and Industry will provide further details. I've touched on the measures to support our enterprises to build deep capabilities so that they can succeed in the global competition. But the ultimate goal is to enable our people to continue to have good jobs and opportunities and to be at their best. Hence, the second thrust of our economic transformation in this budget is to deepen the capabilities of our workers. As the Chinese say, our people need to be nimble to build industry-relevant skills throughout their lives. We want our people to have the skills, knowledge and attitudes to adapt and thrive in this competitive and technology-intensive environment. In this regard, the leadership of companies plays a key role. The leaders of successful companies are those who are committed to raising the capabilities of their workers by redesigning jobs and reskilling their staff. These capabilities are key to the company's successes. I recently visited Fairprice Distribution Center, which has adopted automated storage and retrieval systems to improve the efficiency of its online store operations. Among the staff I spoke to were Mr. Amza bin Muhammad Ali and Madam Lee In Fong. Between them, they have worked at Fair Price for 30 years. I asked how the new technology has impacted their work. They told me that Fair Price training has helped them to quickly pick up new skills, to make use of new systems, and their work environment is more pleasant and conducive. Fair Price is a good example of how an enterprise can strive to serve her customers better deploy technology and new ways of working, and at the same time, redesign jobs and reskill workers so that everyone is better off. Many enterprises are doing this, and I urge more to take this approach. On the part of the government, we'll continue to invest in our people across all stages of their lives, from preschool to work. Over the years, <coughs> we have instituted a range of support measures for workers, including the Workfare Income Supplement, Special Employment Credits, and Professional Conversion Programs, to name a few. This range from helping low-wage workers and older workers through wage support, to equipping young graduates to have a good start in their careers, and enabling experienced professionals to access new jobs. In particular, NTUC has been working closely with member unions and companies to enable workers to learn new skills and grow. With the National Skills Future Movement and the Adapt and Grow initiatives, we have made a stronger push to enable our people to reach their fullest potential throughout life and help Singaporeans affected by restructuring. Our investments in supporting our people in their careers including the Adapt and Grow initiatives and continuing education and training, reached more than $1.1 billion in financial year 2017. Our people are making good efforts to invest in their learning with good outcomes. The percentage of residents in the labour force who participated in training grew from 35% in 2015 to 48% in 2018. From 2016 to 2018, more than 76,000 job seekers found employment through the Adapt and Grow initiative. Workers, firms, unions and TACs all need to play a part to continue this progress. Workers need to embrace upskilling and reskilling and make the most of new opportunities both locally and overseas. Firms must step up training and job redesign for their workers as they are well-placed to know the skill their workers need as the sectors evolve. One example is Mr. Abdul Jalil bin Idros, who started as a technical officer at YTL Power Saraya. Over the years, 
The company sponsored his bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering. Through continuous learning as he worked, Mr. Abdul Jalil moved from maintenance to managing plant upgrading projects. He's now training his colleague in cybersecurity and systems operations. He received the Skills Future Fellowships Award in 2018 for his exemplary efforts. Besides workers and firms, unions, TACs, and professional bodies need to spearhead the reskilling and the upskilling of workers in various sectors. I'm heartened by the Institute of Singapore's Chartered Accountants collaboration with the Singapore University of Social Sciences to develop the Joint Business Analytics Certification Program. This program, which was launched a year ago, equips accounting professionals with practical skills in data analytics. We'll continue to enable our experienced professionals to build on their experience to move into new growth areas. Since the establishment of the PCP in 2007, over 100 PCPs have been launched in about 30 sectors. This year, we will launch new PCPs relating to blockchains, embedded software, and prefabrication to prepare our people to move into new growth areas. In 2015, we launched a career support program to provide wage support for employers to hire eligible Singaporeans who are mature and retrenched or are in long-term unemployment. We will extend this program for two years. We must also ensure that the benefits of enterprise transformation are passed on to our workers. Starting from 1st April 2020, all transformation efforts supported by Enterprise Singapore's Enterprise Development Grant must include positive outcomes for workers, such as wage increases. NTUC, I know NTUC and its unions are putting extra effort and resources to support our firms and workers in this. Although some firms have done well to deploy their staff efficiently, productivity growth has been uneven across sectors. The manufacturing sector, which faces strong global competition, has done well. In the services sector, while some firms have done well, despite a tight labour market, some segments like F&B and retail remain very labour intensive. Growth in SPAS and work permit holders in the services sector has also been picking up pace. The number has risen by about 3% per annum, or 34,000, in the last three years. In particular, the SPAS growth in services is the highest in five years. If this trend persists, foreign manpower growth will be on an unsustainable path. We need to act decisively to manage the manpower growth in services and encourage our companies to revamp work processes, redesign jobs, and rescue our workers. Our workforce growth is tapering. And if we do not use this narrow window to double down on restructuring, our companies will find it even harder in the future. Relying on more and more foreign workers is not the long-term solution. Other economies are developing too. What we need is to have a sustainable inflow of foreign workers to complement our workforce while we upgrade our Singaporean workers and build deep enterprise capabilities in these sectors. We must enhance the complementarities of our local and foreign workers. The basic approach to our foreign workers' policies has remained consistent. Based on evidence of the pace of foreign workers' inflows, and the progress being made in raising productivity across sectors, we need to calibrate our policies. The government recognises the economic headwinds and cost pressures ahead of us. But if we do not take action early, our firms will find it harder to compete in the years ahead, and our workers will be left behind. After much deliberation, we will adjust the workforce quota for the services sector. Reduce the services sector dependency ratio ceiling, or DRC, in two steps, from 40% to 38% on 1st January 2020 and to 35% on 1st 
on 1st January 2021. We'll also reduce the services sector SPAS sub-DRC in two steps, from 15% to 13% on 1st January 2020 and to 10% on 1st January 2021. We're announcing these changes about a year ahead to give companies time to prepare. For firms whose existing workers are in excess of the new limits, the DRC will apply as and when these firms apply for renewal of permits. To support firms as they adjust to these changes, we'll put in place the following measures till FY 2022. First, the 70% funding support level for the Enterprise Development Grant was due to lapse after 31st March 2020. I will now extend this enhanced funding support for three more years, up to 31st March 2023. Second, we'll do the same for the Productivity Solutions Grant and expand its scope to support up to 70% of the out-of-pocket costs for training. Separately, firms can continue to apply for additional manpower flexibilities in certain cases. The Lean Enterprise Development Scheme provides support to firms that undertake transformation projects which lead to more manpower lean businesses. Transitional manpower flexibilities can be considered if firms need more resources in the short term to transit to new operating models. On a case-by-case -case basis, firms can bring in foreign workers with specialised skills that are in demand globally. This is provided they still face a shortage after having given fair consideration to Singaporeans. The Minister for Trade and Industry and the Minister for Manpower will provide more details at the COS. As the marine shipyard and process sectors have only begun showing early signs of recovery, I would defer the earlier announced increase in foreign worker levy rates for these sectors for another year. I've spoken on how Budget 2019 supports the building of deep enterprise capabilities and the building of deep worker capabilities. Let me now touch on the third key trust to support economic transformation, building deep partnerships within Singapore and across the world. To succeed, companies need to both compete and cooperate, compete to differentiate themselves and cooperate to solve common challenges. Our trade associations and chambers can play an important role in developing industry-wide capabilities. This includes supporting members in getting business advice and improving access to local and international markets. TACs have done well in helping our companies build overseas partnerships. For example, the Singapore FinTech Association has forged many partnerships with foreign FinTech associations, and the Singapore Business Federation has organized Singapore's commercial participation at numerous overseas trade fairs, including the 2018 China International Import Expo. The Singapore Chinese Chamber of Commerce and Industry has also developed the Trade Association Hub, which now houses 39 TACs to raise the level of services for members. SBF is also working closely with our TACs we will support our support for TACs through the Local Enterprise and Association Development on LEAD program. Enterprise Singapore will be developing five-year roadmaps with TACs that have demonstrated strong leadership and shown ambition to do more for the business community. This will enable them to take on a more strategic and longer-term approach in driving industry transformation. These TACs will be able to access funding and potentially taking public sector secondes through LEAD. We also develop stronger partnerships around the world at the government to the government and business to business levels. Our TACs, such as the SPF, have developed international linkages for our businesses. Over the years, we have negotiated free trade agreements with partner economies, which enlarge our businesses' access to new markets. Just last week, the EU-Singapore Free Trade Agreement and the EU-Singapore Investment Protection Agreement 
received the European Parliament's consent with a clear majority. To draw greater value from these trade networks, we will streamline and digitize our trade processes further to raise efficiency. This will enable easier access to overseas markets and help our firms make better use of these FTAs. Last year, I launched the Network Trade Platform, or NTP, to streamline trade processes and provide one-stop information management system for traders. We'll also be working with partners to facilitate the secure exchange of electronic trade documents to unlock further productivity gains. Members will appreciate that the three key thrusts I've just announced, building deep capabilities in our enterprises and in our people, and forging deep partnerships, built on the ITMs I announced in Budget 2016. With the progress we have made, we are better prepared for major changes that are coming our way. One major change is the speed of advancements and convergence of new technologies in what some have dubbed the fourth industrial revolution or industry 4.0. This will transform the way we invest, trade and consume. Over the years, we have forged deep partnerships with the G3 economies of US, Europe and Japan, as well as China, India and ASEAN. With the center of economic gravity shifting to Asia, and with the technological depth of our partnerships with the G3 economies, we should position Singapore as Asia 101 for global MNCs looking to expand into Asia's growing markets, and as Global 101 for Asian companies ready to go global. For our next phase of growth, as we press on with industry transformation, we'll continue to build Singapore's position as a global Asia node of technology, innovation, and enterprise. This will open up new opportunities for our firms and our people to ride on the wave of the fourth industrial revolution. Our efforts to achieve this will build on the same three key thrusts as laid out for the broader economic transformation. First, investments in research and innovation by our universities, research institutes, and our firms. Second, investments in our people. And third, building global partnerships. First, we'll continue to invest in R&D to support the push to make innovation pervasive. We'll set aside $19 billion as part of our five-year research, innovation, and enterprise 2020 plan. Our investments in R&D in our universities and research institutes are bearing fruit. NUS and NTU are ranked the best in Asia in areas such as material science and chemistry, and among the top 50 globally for engineering and computer science. Many of our researchers are regarded by their peers as among the world's best, especially in areas such as artificial intelligence, quantum technologies, and biomedical sciences. ASTAR has research institutes that are highly regarded. Together with our universities, they are actively working to translate research findings into innovation in partnerships with industries. But for R&D to make an impact, our companies must take the lead. Members of this house will be encouraged to know that some sectors are moving ahead, including two old economy sectors. First, despite digital advancements, we still need brick and mortar buildings. The construction sector, seen as low tech and labor intensive, is now using integrated digital delivery. This makes use of building information modeling and other digital technologies, connecting different players working on the same construction projects. This has raised productivity and created new high value jobs such as 3D modelers. Site productivity has improved by about 15% over the last eight years. Second, in the digital age, we still need food, not just bits and bytes. The agriculture and food production sectors are transforming. For example, AVAs 
Marine Aquaculture Centre and Temasek Life Sciences Laboratory have de developed the St. John's sea bass. This fish is less susceptible to disease and can be bred in 30% less time. A startup, Allegro Aqua, is looking to bring more St. John's sea bass to the world. Another example is Temasek Life Sciences Laboratory's Temasek Rice, which produces four times as much rice per hectare as compared to regular breeds of rice. To tap on the demand for high quality food and to build on our progress, Enterprise Singapore's investment arms, Seeds Capital, has appointed seven partners to co-invest in Singapore-based agri-food startups to catalyze more than $90 million of investments. Leading MNCs and our large local companies are also establishing their R&D centers in Singapore in different areas of technology. We now have 14 corporate laboratories in our universities doing cutting edge work from cyber fiscal systems to power electronics. Last year, we opened four corporate labs with major companies, Applied Materials, HP, Bilmer, and Sabana Jurong to work on advanced manufacturing, biochemicals, and smart cities. I recently visited Lux Photonics Consortium, which brings together researchers in NUS, NTU, ASTAR, and the industry to translate cutting-edge photonics research into practical applications. There I met NanoView, a Singapore startup specializing in nanotechnology applications. One of its prototype products, a high-tech screen protector, promises to allow long-sighted users to see clear images on digital devices without their glasses and to see 3D image from 2D films. That's another project. So I'm sure this house will support the enabling of us all to see issues far or near with greater clarity and perspective. Now I also met Technolite. Our helix bridge and new buildings, such as the Jewel at Changi Airport, are lit in scintillating ways by Technolite. The company is embarking on R&D to take its products to a new level. So I wish NanoView and Technolite success to light up our lives and to let us see better. To keep the momentum going, we'll continue to invest in centers of innovation at our institutes of higher learning and research institutes and to support companies in innovation. Enterprise Singapore is collaborating with industry partners to establish a center of innovation in aquaculture at Temasek Polytechnic. This center will bring together aquaculture firms to improve our food resilience. Enterprise Singapore will also launch a center of innovation in energy at NTU, building on earlier investments at the Energy Research Institute at NTU. The center will collaborate with the Sustainable Energy Association of Singapore to drive industry-led innovation in areas such as energy efficiency, renewable energy, and electric mobility. We'll share more about these exciting new research in initiatives at the Research Innovation and Enterprise Council meeting next month. The spirit of entrepreneurship is critical for all of these endeavors. Having a vision of the future and taking practical actions day in, day out to explore a range of possibilities and solve a myriad of problems. It is the grit and determination of our entrepreneurs that make a difference. Mr. Sim Wong Hu, CEO of Creative Technology, brought us a popular sound blaster cards in the 1990s. Creative Technology went through a difficult patch after its initial success with the sound blaster, but Mr. Sim and his team pressed on. After 20 years of R&D costing US $100 million, the company recently launched the Super X5, a technology that recreates the holographic sound experience, all 3D sound, with headphones, personalized. It has already won 14 awards at the 2019 Consumer Electronics Show in the US. Having tried it myself and having heard the endorsement of audio files including some in these chambers, I'm happy that Mr. Sim and his team are at the cusp of a major breakthrough, and I wish them every success. Mr. Sim's story illustrates the point that to succeed, 
We must learn, we must walk the ground, and we must persist. I've touched on our efforts in research, innovation, and enterprise. Singapore as a global Asia node will bring new opportunities for our people in new frontiers. The second thrust is to prepare and develop our people to make full use of this node. We are partnering firms to invest in our people, including young Singaporeans, to provide them with opportunities to gain working experience abroad. For students who are currently in IHLs, we'll combine the current local and overseas internship programs into a single Global Ready Talent Program, or GREAT. You will have enhanced funding support for our students interning overseas with Singapore firms. The program will also support high-growth Singapore firms to send Singaporeans with up to three years of working experience for postings in key markets such as Southeast Asia, China, and India. By giving young Singaporeans overseas exposure, they can develop new skills to better support our firm's overseas expansion. For instance, Oceanus Group, a local seafood supplier, sent interns from Republic Polytechnic to its operations in China in a range of jobs. One of the former interns, Bernice Chan, is now a management trainee in Oceanus Farm in Fotan, China. Our third trust is to build global partnerships so that our firms and people can forge new areas of collaboration with other innovation centres. In Budget 2017, we started the Global Innovation Alliance, one of the Committee on the Future Economy's recommendations. We have now established nine nodes in global startup hotspots, such as Bangkok, Beijing, Berlin, Jakarta, and San Francisco. These GIA nodes give our entrepreneurs and students opportunities to learn and build networks globally. We're also bringing the global innovation community to come together in Singapore to explore and collaborate. Last year, we held the third edition of the Singapore FinTech Festival. This is now the world's largest FinTech festival. As part of this festival, the Global Investor Summit brought together investors on our Meet ASEAN Talents and Champions, or MATCH, platform. These investors expressed an interest to invest up to US $12 billion in ASEAN enterprises, in FinTech, Info Communications Technologies, and MedTech over the next three years. And under technology events, the Singapore Week of Innovation and Technology, or SWITCH, brought together more than 350 exhibitors and 1,000 promising startups and financiers from 75 countries. To maximize impact, this year, SWITCH and the Singapore FinTech Festival will be held in the same week in mid-November. We can join even more entrepreneurs, investors, innovators from around the world to explore and collaborate in technology innovation in this fourth industrial revolution. These various programs on economic transformation and jobs built on our efforts and investments over the years. To summarize, our economic transformation is progressing well, but we must persist with our industry transformation efforts. At the same time, the pace of technological innovation is rapid, and global economic weight is shifting towards Asia. We will position Singapore as a global Asia node of technology, innovation, and enterprise. Economic transformation is critical. We expect to spend $4.6 billion over the next three years on the new and enhanced economic capability measures in Budget 2019 and to support Singaporean workers. $3.6 billion will go towards helping our workers to thrive amid industry and technological changes. $1 billion will go towards helping firms build deep enterprise capabilities. But let me emphasize that supporting companies and supporting workers are mutually reinforcing. Stronger companies provide better jobs and pay for workers and highly skilled workers make companies stronger. I'm confident that we can continue to make good progress. Our enterprises and TACs, workers and unions, 
and the government must continue to work closely together. As long as we stay relevant and useful to the world, we can continue to create opportunities for our people and enterprises. As you can see, it's a long speech. I have two files. <clears throat> I've spoken about how we invest to secure our home and grow our economy. At the heart of these efforts is the desire to improve the lives of current and future generations of Singaporeans. Our approach to social development has served us well. We invest heavily to bring out the best in our people. We believe that access to quality education enables Singaporeans to realise their potential. We strive to ensure that all Singaporeans, regardless of background, enjoy a quality living environment and have good access to health care. And we provide targeted support for those who are less advantaged so that they can have a fair chance to succeed and to those who fall on hard times so they can bounce back. Our efforts were affirmed by the World Bank when they ranked Singapore top in the Human Capital Index last year. We recognise that Singapore, like many advanced economies, will have to deal with issues such as maintaining social mobility, supporting healthy and purposeful ageing, and fostering a stronger sense of unity amid polarising forces. Over the past decade or so, we have significantly increased our social spending Social ministry's expenditures have doubled from $15 billion in FY2009 to $30 billion in FY2018. The social measures in Budget 2019 are part of our long-term plan to build a caring and inclusive society. They are driven by three main strategies. First, uplifting Singaporeans to maximise their potential and providing access to opportunities through their stages of life. We pay particular attention to children from disadvantaged backgrounds to give them a good start in life. With increasing lifespans, we are helping older Singaporeans stay in the workforce so that they can earn and save more for retirement. Second, providing greater assurance for health care. We'll continue to strengthen support for the health care needs of Singaporeans. In particular, we want to help our seniors stay active, healthy and engaged in their silver years. Third, fostering a community of care and contribution through strong partnerships. We strive to nurture an ethos in our society where we support one another and give a helping hand where we can. Those who succeed should help to uplift others just as they have benefited from the support of others around them. As the Chinese say, Tong Zhou Gong Ji, Gong Chuang Wei Lai, we are in the same boat and weather the storms together. We progress together and forge our future together. I'll first talk about how we are supporting our children, workers, and seniors to access the best opportunities through each stage of life. We invest heavily to provide a world-class education for young Singaporeans. This is to bring out the best in every child, no matter his or her starting point. I know this is an area of deep concern for many Singaporeans. Many of you expressed this during feedback sessions and through your actions in giving time and money to help children in need. Preschools support parents in laying a strong foundation for children by helping to develop their children's cognitive, language, social and emotional skills. Therefore, we are spending more to enhance accessibility, affordability and quality of early childhood education and care. The government spent about $1 billion on the preschool sector in 2018. This is more than two and a half times of the $360 million that we spent back in just 2012. 
and this support continues throughout the schooling years. The government subsidizes over 90% of the total costs of educating our children. This means that a child entering primary school in 2018 will receive over $130,000 in education subsidies by the time he or she completes secondary education. Children from low-income families get even more support, for example, through the recently enhanced MOE financial assistance schemes. We have been doing more to better support children from disadvantaged backgrounds by intervening earlier with new forms of proactive and targeted support. One such effort is KidStart. KidStart practitioners, preschools and community partners work together to provide health, learning and developmental support for children and their families. Since the pilot began in 2016, more than 900 families have been supported by KidStart. Last year, we set up the Uplifting Pupils in Life and Inspiring Families Task Force, or Uplift. This task force will pilot upstream interventions and partner communities to help disadvantaged children and families to ensure that no child is left behind. A recent initiative is the Uplift Scholarship for Independent Schools. This will provide a monetary award of $800 per year for eligible lower-income students in independent schools to cover their out-of-pocket expenses. The task force is also looking at how to strengthen after-school care and support for disadvantaged students in school-based student care centres. The Minister for Education will speak more about this and other initiatives spurred by Uplift at the COS. Our support for Singaporeans continues into their working lives. Workfare and civil support are two key pillars of our social security systems. The two schemes supplement incomes and mitigate inequality in the working and retirement years, respectively. The Workfare Income Supplement, or WIS scheme, provides cash payouts and CPF top-ups for workers whose earnings are in the bottom 20% with some support for those slightly above. The scheme has raised their income, encouraged employment, and helped them save more for retirement. We'll enhance workfare income supplements to better support lower wage workers. From January 2020, the qualifying income cap will be raised from the current $2,000 to $2,300 per month. The maximum annual payouts will also be increased by up to $400. Older workers will see higher increases in payouts. For example, workers aged 60 and earning $1,200 a month will now receive $4,000 per year from the Workfare Income Supplement, or almost 30% of their wages. These enhancements will cost an additional $206 million a year. In total, we expect the enhanced workfare income supplement to cost close to $1 billion a year and benefit almost 440,000 Singaporeans. As our society ages, older workers will make up an increasing share of our workforce. Today, about one in four of our workforce is aged 55 and above. They continue to make important contributions to our economy and society. Some are giving back by mentoring the younger generations, while others wish to continue working. We're doing more to help older Singaporeans earn more, save more, and have greater peace of mind during their retirement years. I appreciate the concerns and suggestions regarding the retirement adequacy of older workers raised by members of the public and the PAP seniors group, among others. And I thank the members of this House for your views during the recent debate on the motions on ageing with purpose and support for caregivers. The government has set up a tri tripartite work group to study the concerns of older workers. The work group is reviewing policies such as the retirement and re-employment age 
and the CPF contribution rates of older workers. They will present their recommendations later this year. To support employers in hiring older Singaporean workers, the government introduced the Special Employment Credit, or SEC, scheme in 2011. Since then, we have extended and made changes to the SEC in response to labour market and economic conditions. We have also introduced an additional SEC, or ASEC, scheme to encourage employers to hire workers who are above the re-employment age. I'm happy that companies have responded by hiring older workers, tapping on their experiences and supporting them in upgrading their skills. With a tighter labour market and more Singaporeans choosing to work longer, more companies will be hiring older workers. The government will study better forms of support to continue to help workers to remain productive, earn more and save more for retirement. We will review the relevance and structure of the SEC and ASEC in tandem with the recommendations from the Tripartite Work Group on older workers. In the meantime, I will extend the SEC and ASEC for another year until 31st December 2020. To support this extension, I will top up the SEC fund by $366 million. Taken together, members will see that the government has been making significant investments in education and employment for our people, from early childhood to the working years. Our aim is to help Singaporeans fulfil their potential at each stage of life. We are improving the lives of our people by enabling them to be the best that they can be. We enhance our people's sense of well-being and dignity without the burden of welfare schemes elsewhere, which weaken people's sense of urgency and independence. As more Singaporeans enter their senior years, healthcare needs will grow. Over the years, we have implemented major changes to make healthcare more affordable, accessible, and comprehensive. We have also been providing greater social support within the community to help seniors stay active through programs such as the PA Wellness Program and the Community Networks for Seniors. Our second social strategy is to provide greater healthcare assurance. First, doctors at our neighbourhood clinics provide primary care that is easily accessible. This helps us stay healthy. To enhance access, we'll make it more affordable to consult doctors in our neighbourhoods. We introduced the Community Health Assist Scheme, or CHAS, in 2012. CHAS subsidizes subsidies help lower to middle income families by making primary care and basic dental care at clinics near their homes more affordable. Over 97% of existing CHAS and Pioneer Generation card holders have access to more than one CHAS clinics within 10 minutes from their homes. We'll enhance CHAS subsidies at GP clinics in three ways. As the Prime Minister announced at the National Day Rally last year, we'll extend CHAS to cover all Singaporeans for chronic conditions, regardless of income. Second, Lower to middle income Singaporeans who are CHAS orange card holders currently receive CHAS subsidies for chronic conditions only. We will extend subsidies for common illnesses to this group. Third, we will increase the subsidies for complex chronic conditions. CHAS makes it possible for more Singaporeans to turn to GP clinics near their homes to manage their chronic conditions. But we must also put in the measures to ensure that CHAS clinics are delivering good outcomes. To this end, the Ministry of Health will be looking at how to help CHAS clinics better track the patient's progress and outcomes. In a similar vein, 
MOH will also review its clinical guidelines for care provided at Charles Dental Clinics to ensure that the care delivered is appropriate to the needs of the patients. With these changes, we expect to pay out more than $200 million a year in CHAS subsidies. The Minister for Health will provide more details on these changes at the COS. A second way to provide greater health care assurance is that we will strengthen financial protection for long-term care. As we age, the chances of having one form of disability or another rises significantly. MOH estimates that one in two healthy Singaporeans aged 65 could become severely disabled in their lifetime and may need long-term care. Some of us face a higher risk, some lower. But regardless, low risk does not mean no risk. The best way of protecting ourselves is to lead a healthy lifestyle and take preventive actions. At the same time, we need to guard against unpredictable events. The most efficient way is to help one another by pooling risk through an insurance scheme. Today, we have MediShield Life for all Singaporeans to provide financial protection against large hospital bills for life. As we live longer, there is a higher chance that we will need long-term care towards the end of our lives. We need to prepare for this. The Ministry of Health has announced that you, you'll be introducing the new Care Shield Life from 2020, an enhancement of the current Elder Shield Scheme. Care Shield Life will provide lifetime coverage with higher monthly payouts of at least $600 a month for those who, be, who become severely disabled. This offsets the cost of long-term care for individuals and their families. The government will provide subsidies and premium support to ensure that Care Shield Life premiums are affordable. We will also offer participation incentives for existing cohorts born in 1979 or earlier to join Care Shield Life so that they are better protected should they need care in the future. Care Shield Life will offer much greater peace of mind for Singaporeans. In addition, we'll also launch Elder Fund next year to help severely disabled lower-income Singaporeans who need additional financial support for long-term care. This includes those who might not be able to join Care Shield Life or have low MediSafe balances. The cost of long-term care is not only high, but will increase as our population ages. Last year, I earmarked $2 billion for premium subsidies and other forms of support for Singaporeans. This year, I will set aside another $3.1 billion. The government will put this $5.1 billion into a new long-term care support fund. This will help fund the Care Shield Life subsidies and other long-term care support measures, such as Elder Fund. This is a significant commitment to help Singaporeans with their long-term care needs. <clears throat> As the Prime Minister mentioned at the National Day Rally last year and the tribute event earlier this month, we would also like to express our appreciation and support for our Medica generation. The Medica generation is a resilient and independent generation. They played a critical role in our nation's development. The Medica generation was among the earliest batches to serve national service, build up our public services, and modernize our economy. They came together to forge our multicultural, multiracial society. One member of the Medica generation is Miss Barbara Dicotta. Ms. Dicotta started work as a special education teacher at the age of 19 to help support her mother. In 1984, she was among the first batch of teachers to attain a certificate in special education. Throughout her life, she continued learning and completed her bachelor in special education in 2016 at the age of 57. Today, 
She is a specialized teacher for students with hearing deficiencies and a volunteer interpreter. She is also pursuing her Master of Special Education. She is an excellent example of lifelong learning and giving. I'm glad to have met Ms. Dakota and many others who built our nation at our Medica Generation Tribute event. They continue to be an active generation, contributing in their various capacities at work, in the community, caring for their families, and learning something new. The Medica Generation Package is a gesture of our nation's gratitude for their contributions and a way to show care for them in their silver years. You will provide them better peace of mind over future health care costs while helping them to stay active and healthy. The Medica Generation Package, or MGP, comprises five key benefits. First, to support their active lifestyle, all Medica Generation seniors will receive a one-time $100 top-up to their PA Passion Silver Cards. They can use this to pay for activities and facilities at the community clubs, entry to public swimming pools, public transport, and more. We also work to introduce more active aging opportunities for seniors, such as lifelong learning under the National Silver Academy and volunteerism under the Silver Volunteer Fund. Second, we'll provide a MediSafe top-up of $200 per year for five years. This will start from this year until 2023. This will help them save more for their health care needs. This is on top of the GST voucher MediSafe top-ups that eligible seniors aged 65 and above receive every year. Third, MG seniors will receive additional subsidies for outpatient care for life. They will receive special charge subsidies for common illnesses, chronic conditions, and dental procedures. The subsidy rates will be higher than the Charles Blue subsidies. All MG seniors will receive these enhanced subsidies regardless of income, including those who do not have a Charles card today. At polyclinics and public specialist outpatient clinics, they will receive 25% of their subsidized bills. This is on top of the prevailing subsidies available. Fourth, MG seniors will have additional MediShield Life Premium subsidies for life. All MG seniors will receive subsidies for their premiums, starting from 5% of their MediShield Life Premiums and increasing to 10% after they reach 75 years of age. This is on top of the means-tested subsidies that low- and middle-income Singaporeans are already receiving. Finally, we'll provide an additional participation incentive of $1,500 for MG seniors who join CareShield Life when it becomes available for existing cohorts in 2021. In addition to the $2,500 previously announced, this means that all MG seniors will join CareShield Life, who join CareShield Life, will receive participation incentives totaling $4,000 each. This will cover a significant portion of their premiums and is on top of the regular means-tested premium subsidies. I hope this will encourage our MG seniors to join CareShield Life to have peace of mind against the risk of high long-term care costs. There are a number of other details which I will include in the annex uh, and will be given to the media. The medical generation package will benefit close to 500,000 Singaporeans. Those born in the 1950s and who obtained citizenship by 1996 will be eligible for the MGP. In addition, we will extend the MGP benefits to those born in 1949 or earlier, but missed out on the Pioneer Generation package if they obtain citizenship by 1996. All eligible seniors will receive the MGP benefits regardless of their income. 
will be notified by April 2019, I will receive the medical generation cards starting from June 2019. The Minister for Health will provide further details and the implementation timeline for the MGP benefits at the COS. The medical generation is aged 60 to 69 today. Singaporeans' lifespan are increasing. Our life expectancy is now 84.8 years. This is good news. It means that the Medica generation will be able to enjoy the benefits for many years. The Ministry of Finance and MOH, in sizing the budget for these benefits, have taken this into account. We estimate that the package will cost over $8 billion in current dollars over the medical generation's lifetimes. This budget, I will set aside $6.1 billion for a new medical generation fund. With interest accumulated over time, this will cover the full projected cost of the medical generation package. The medical generation will enjoy many key healthcare benefits for life. We hope that this will go some way in providing greater peace of mind for the medical generation and their families. This is a significant commitment by the government. It is important that the government of the day continues to monitor the patterns and costs of healthcare utilization and life expectancy over the next 30 years or more, so that the government is able to meet this commitment. To better prepare for increasing lifespans, we should encourage everyone to set aside something for the future. To help Singaporeans who are younger than the Medica generation with the future healthcare expenses, I'll provide MediSafe top-up of $100 a year for the next five years for Singaporeans who are aged 50 and above in 2019 and who do not receive the MGP or the PGP. This is a generation who are even younger and healthier, and I hope that everyone will make the extra effort to stay active and healthy. Our third social strategy is to foster a community of care and contribution and build strong partnerships in our society. The government will continue to make every effort to care for our seniors, the disadvantaged, and vulnerable families. The long-term care assistance scheme provides basic monthly cash assistance to those who are permanently unable to work and have little family support to support their living expenses. Additional assistance is provided for households with additional needs such as medical supplies. We'll raise the cash assistance rates for this scheme. For example, a two-person household who are both on long-term, who are both on Comcare long-term assistance will receive an additional $130 a month. This brings a total cash assistance to $1,000 a month. The Minister for Social and Family Development will provide more details at the COS. To help government pensioners who draw lower pensions, we'll increase the Singapore allowance and monthly pension ceiling by $20 per month each to $320 and $1,250 respectively. This will benefit about 9,300 pensions. Working alongside the government, individuals, non-profit organizations and corporates have all been playing their part, contributing their skills, their time and their hearts. As we reflect on our history and culture in this bicentennial year, let us, we see the spirit of helping one another as a community in action over time. In the past, our forefathers who arrived in Singapore banded together, mainly within their ethnic groups, forming various clans and associations as the support of the government then was inadequate. Today, I'm glad this spirit extends across ethnic and religious lines in our society. In the last few months, we have received many good suggestions from members of the public on cultivating this community spirit 
to help those in need. As our society ages and new needs emerge, we hope everyone will lend a helping hand. One good example is Mr. Shalim Kamaluddin and his friends from PALS Singapore. PALS stands for Peace and Love Society, a non-profit organisation that provides support network for Singaporean youth from all backgrounds. Through sports events and workshops, Shalim and other like-minded volunteers have been helping young Singaporeans learn skills to overcome challenges such as bullying and cyber addiction. To date, they have touched the lives of about 800 youths. Another example is Dr. Rose Sivam, who started My Home, Your Home. With her husband as a chef, Rose and her family bring together people from various backgrounds, including those with disabilities and children with special needs, to share a meal in her home. This is another good example of our community spirit, how we care for the less privileged and build unity in our diversity. I'm heartened that many other Singaporeans too have stepped forward in their own ways to make a difference within their community, and I encourage everyone to do their part. I spoke about the SG CARES movement at last year's budget. It seeks to bring together the public, people, and private sectors in partnership, create a greater collective impact, and grow as a community of care and contribution. This year, we continue to build on the SG CARES movement. We have three measures to mobilize our people across all age groups and across the public, private, and people sectors. First, growing the spirit of volunteerism in our youth. Many of our secondary school students are already active volunteers and are giving back to the community. We want to sustain this momentum as they move to IHLs and later into the workplace. We are working with Youth Cause Singapore to nurture youth community leaders in our IHLs, who can in turn rally their peers to be involved in the community on a sustained basis. Second, our seniors have an abundance of skills and experience to make meaningful contributions. To enable more of them to do so, we'll work with community partners and companies to encourage volunteerism among older workers. This will enable our seniors to stay active and contribute to the community at work and when they retire. Third, the government is encouraging all public officers to volunteer under the Public Service CARES initiative. Today, each ministry has a senior officer appointed as a giving ambassador to champion volunteerism. More than 85% of public officers are making monthly donations. Going forward, public service cares will strengthen capabilities in corporate social responsibility and create larger scale and sustained voluntary, volunteering opportunities for public officers across agencies. For example, they can take part in house visits to share health care and active aging schemes or guide seniors in their mobile devices at digital clinics. This will also help public service officers to better understand citizens' needs and co-deliver services with the people and private sectors. This is the public services contribution to the SG CARES movement. The Minister for Culture, Community and Youth will be sharing more on SG CARES at the COS. The spirit of giving back has a special meaning this year as we commemorate the Singapore Bicentennial. Therefore, I will launch two special initiatives in support for this. First, <clears throat> I will set aside $200 million for a Bicentennial Community Fund. Today, we encourage individuals and corporates to give back to the community in various ways. Donations to institutions of a public character qualify for a 250% tax deduction. Businesses also enjoy a 250% tax deduction on qualifying expenditure 
when their employees volunteer or provide services to IPCs under the Business and IPC Partnership Scheme. The new Bicentennial Community Fund will provide dollar-for-dollar -dollar matching for donations made to IPCs in financial year 2019. With this, we hope to further encourage more Singaporeans, including younger Singaporeans, to embrace the spirit of giving back. At the same time, we are encouraging IPCs to reach out to more donors. The fund will be designed to ensure a good distribution of support for all donations to IPCs, which currently do not receive government matching, and to increase the impact of the good work they are doing. We have also enhanced our one-stop platform, Giving.sg, to better match donors and volunteers with meaningful causes. This platform provides charities with an easy and secure way to establish an online presence and to receive donations digitally. Donors too can quickly navigate and find a worthy cause that matches their passion and commitment and start on their giving journey. Details will be shared by the Ministry of Culture, Community and Youth at a later date. Second, I will introduce a $1.1 billion bicentennial bonus. From time to time, when our finances allow, we share the surpluses with Singaporeans and provide more help to those with specific needs. With this bonus, I hope all Singaporeans, young and old, will join us to commemorate this significant moment in Singapore's history. The bicentennial bonus has several components. For lower-income Singaporeans, I will provide additional help with their daily living expenses. I will provide up to $300 through a GST voucher cash bicentennial payment. This will benefit 1.4 million Singaporeans. In addition, lower-income workers who receive workfare income supplement payments will get a workfare bicentennial bonus they will receive an additional 10% of their WIS payment for work done in 2018 with a minimum payment of $100. This will be given in cash. I will provide a 50% personal income tax rebate subject to a cap of $200 for the year of assessment 2019. I set the cap at $200 so that the benefits go mostly to middle-income earners. For parents with school-going children, we will provide additional support for their children's education. Each year, the government contributes to the EduSafe accounts of all Singaporean students at primary and secondary school levels. This helps to pay for school enrichment activities to better develop students holistically. This year, we will provide a $150 top-up to their EduSafe accounts. This is on top of the annual EduSafe contributions that they already receive from the government. In addition, Singaporeans aged 17 to 20 will receive up to $500 in their post-secondary education accounts. This will go towards helping parents to save for their children's tertiary education. We will also provide support, additional support for older Singaporeans who are near retirement. I'll provide a CPF top-up of up to $1,000 for eligible Singaporeans aged 50 to 64 years old in 2019 who have less than $60,000 of retirement savings in their CPF accounts. This will be credited to the special accounts for members aged 50 to 54 and the retirement account for members aged 55 to 64. About 300,000 Singaporeans will benefit from this CPF top-up. The majority of these recipients will be women. Many of them left the workforce early and took up important roles as mothers, caregivers or housewives. As a result, they had fewer years to build up their savings. This top-up is a way to recognise their contributions and to help them save more. In addition to the CPF top-ups, Singaporeans in the age group of 50 to 64 who qualify for workfare 
will also benefit from the workfare income supplement enhancements that I mentioned earlier. Most of those in the 60 to 64 age group will also receive the medical generation package, while the rest will receive the five-year MediSafe top-ups. These are all on top of the targeted benefits such as the GST voucher. Together, we hope that these measures will provide greater peace of mind for our older workers now and later in the silver years. In addition to these special bicentennial initiatives, we will provide another year of service and conservancy charges rebates, SNCC rebates, to HDB households. Eligible Singaporean households will receive SNCC rebates of between one and a half and three and a half months. This will cost $132 million and benefit about 930,000 households. Finally, I will top up the public transport fund by $10 million to continue helping commuters in need with their transport expenses, such as through public transport vouchers for lower income families. The government keeps a close watch on the cost of living. Over the years, we have done much to alleviate cost pressures, whether in healthcare, education, or day-to-day -day expenses. Good macroeconomic management has enabled us to keep inflation low, while the Singapore dollar has been strengthening over time. Many Singaporeans who go on overseas vacations would appreciate this. Over and above this favourable condition, this budget continues to provide significant support for Singaporeans, especially our seniors and lower income households. Budget 2019 supports the government's long-term strategy to build a caring and inclusive society. This is our continued effort to improve the lives of our people and our future generations. Today, <clears throat> our shining little red dot can hold its own on the global stage. But as the Minister for National Development has said, we are not done building Singapore. Infrastructure takes time to build, but once built, can serve us for a long time. We must take a long view for our development plans. The upcoming URA Master Plan 2019 will guide our urban developments over a 10 to 15 year time frame. It ensures that our limited land can be optimized to meet the needs of current and future generations. The Minister for National Development will share more details at the COS. The long-term transformation of our city must start with our HDB estates, where most Singaporeans' homes are. It's important that we keep our living environment first class. Many cities have large tracks that slip into disrepair over time. We must avoid that. We must strive to make every town in Singapore green and livable by rejuvenating them systematically over time. As our home and a global node, our city has to be well connected within and with the world. Within Singapore, we now have about 230 kilometres of MRT lines. This will rise to about 360 kilometres in the 2030s, when major MRT projects such as across island lines are completed. To enhance, to enhance our global connectivity, we are increasing the capacities of our airport and seaport. This will strengthen our role as a key node within Asia and to the world. Connecting to future growth, knowledge and cultural centres in Asia and beyond will not only benefit Singaporeans, but will also add to the connectivity and vibrancy in our region. Beyond the next decade, we must also plan for climate change. Climate change and rising sea levels threaten our very existence. As a low-lying island nation, there's nowhere to hide when sea levels rise. Other small island nations, like the Maldives, are already facing risk of flooding 
with severe implications. The government is studying the implications carefully and will come up with measures to prepare ourselves adequately. Our Climate Action Plan, which was launched in 2016, sets out a strategy for mitigating and adapting to the impacts of climate change, especially on our infrastructure. In line with the action plan, low-lying roads near coastal areas have been raised. Changi Airport Terminal 5 will also be built at 5.5 metres above mean sea level. The use of polders and dikes is already being piloted on Pulau Tekong. This will help us learn how to deal with rising sea levels. To protect ourselves against climate change and rising sea levels, we will have to invest more. Together with existing infrastructure needs, our total bill for infrastructure will increase significantly. It is very difficult to project spending needs way into the future, but the different ministries have done some preliminary estimates. We'll continue to do our best to look forward, develop fiscal plans well in advance, and put in place the right approach to finance such long-lived major infrastructure. Each generation should contribute its fair share. Tackling climate change requires global cooperation. Singapore is committed to doing our part. It is a responsible thing to do for our children and future generations. The carbon tax will be applied on this year's emissions. This is an important signal to companies and households to reduce emissions and adopt energy efficient practices. As individuals, we too must change our way and work towards becoming a zero waste nation by adopting the three R's, reducing consumption, reusing and recycling. The Zero Waste Master Plan will be launched in the second half of this year. Among other issues, you look at better management of food waste, e-waste and packaging waste, including plastics. The Minister for the Environment and Water Resources will provide more details at the COS. Given our dense urban environment, air quality and greenery are especially important. NPARCS has done an excellent job in greening Singapore. Our island has more than 40% green cover. This improves our living environment and our air quality. But diesel exhaust is highly pollutive and adversely affects our people's health and quality of life. Many cities in Europe have announced restrictions on diesel vehicle usage. We have taken steps to discourage diesel consumption. Over the years, we have implemented schemes to encourage early renewal of diesel commercial goods vehicles and to also account for the impact of vehicular emissions. We have seen positive results. More owners are shifting towards more environmentally friendly engines such as electric hybrids. We are glad to see a drop in the numbers of new diesel cars and taxis registered. We also restructured diesel taxes in 2017 to shift away from an annual amount of tax towards a usage-based tax system. We permanently reduced the annual special tax on diesel cars and taxis and reintroduced the volumetric diesel duty. To continue the restructuring of diesel taxes, I will raise excise duty for diesel by 10 cents per litre to 20 cents per litre. This takes immediate effect. At the same time, I will permanently reduce the annual special tax on diesel taxis by $850. I strongly urge taxi companies to pass on the savings to their drivers, like they did in 2017. This will, on average, reduce the impact of the duty increase by more than three quarters for taxis. I will also permanently reduce the special tax on diesel cars by $100. This will on average reduce the impact by more than half. To help businesses adjust, I will provide a 100% road tax rebate for one year and partial road tax rebate for another two years for commercial diesel vehicles. I will also provide over three years 
Additional cash rebates of up to $3,200 for diesel buses ferrying school children. Building a more sustainable environment makes our quality of life better and also creates economic opportunities. Just as we close the water loop, we can now turn our attention to closing the waste loop. We already, there are already startups tackling this challenge. Two companies, Ugly Good and Trea, have been working on innovative ways to convert food-related waste into useful products. These are good examples of opportunities in our zero waste management. So I hope to see more of such initiatives in the coming years. Our beautiful living environments can also be enhanced through the smart use of technology as part of our smart nation efforts. To reduce energy usage, we have implemented district cooling in the Marina Bay area. To improve our quality of life, we have started rolling out pneumatic waste collection and trout smart urban mobility solutions. Buildings can also be designed to be environmentally friendly, for example, by being energy efficient and producing enough renewable energy to run itself. BCA was the first to retrofit its academy in 2009, making it the first retrofitted net zero energy building in Southeast Asia. This year, NUS's School of Design Environment launched SDE4, a brand new net zero energy building. These initiatives contribute towards making our environment more sustainable and pleasant. The National Research Foundation will continue to fund research and innovation in urban solutions and sustainability. Our public housing policies have also been uniquely successful because of our long-term planning. Today, we are not just building new flats, we are improving the quality of life of, for Singaporeans through the rejuvenation of our public housing estates. Our plans for the rejuvenation and renewal of our city includes the Home Improvements Program, the Neighbourhood Renewal Program, and the Remaking Our Heartland Initiative. For the longer term, we have announced HIP2 and the Voluntary Early Redevelopment Scheme, or VERSE. These are plans that will keep our living environment first class over the coming years. The Minister for National Development will be sharing more on these plans to build endearing homes for our people at the COS. <clears throat> Singapore's ability to plan for the long term is our strategic advantage. But the, less, the best laid out plans to develop our people and transform our city can only be realised with a sound fiscal plan. Our fiscal discipline and prudence gave us resources to respond decisively to unexpected challenges, such as the 2008 global financial crisis. We must not take this for granted. While our nation's needs are growing significantly, we must continue to take a disciplined and prudent approach. We will pursue new investments using a differentiated fiscal strategy, taking one approach for major infrastructure investments and another for recurrent social and security expenditures. First, infrastructure investments. Some of these are major long-term projects, such as the development of Changi East and rail projects such as a cross-island line. Others, such as infrastructure to protect us against climate change, are contingent on the future state of the world. It is challenging to predict their exact timing and requirements. For these large and lumpy expenditures, where the benefits spend many generations of Singaporeans, paying them through some borrowing is fairer and more efficient. Borrowing done in a responsible and sustainable manner will help instill financial discipline and distribute the share of funding more equitably across current and future generations. In the 1980s, the government borrowed to build our first MRT lines. Our statutory boards and government-owned companies have also contributed to finance many major infrastructure projects through borrowings. 
For the development of Changi East, the Changi Airport Group will be taking up loans to fund its share of the infrastructure investments. To lower financing costs, the government, with the President's concurrence, will provide a guarantee for Changi East borrowings. This allows us to tap on the strength of the government's balance sheet to back this strategic investment. This lowers the cost of borrowing. The government is further studying the option of using government debt as part of the financing, financing mix for long-term infrastructure projects that the government will be taking on directly. Second, for recurrent spending needs in areas such as healthcare, preschool education, and security, we must recognize that these are necessary expenditures to take care of our elderly, give our children a good start in life, and keep Singapore safe and secure for our families. Many countries have taken the easy route by funding these recurrent expenditures through borrowing. We must not do this, as such borrowing shifts the burden of paying for today's needs onto future generations. This is not the Singapore way. A fairer and more robust approach is to meet recurrent spending with recurrent revenues. Hence, we must continually review our tax system to ensure its resilience. GST is a broad-based tax that contributes significantly to our fiscal resources. Last year, I mentioned the introduction of GST on imported services to make sure GST contribution collections remain fair and resilient in the digital economy. This year, I will tighten the GST import relief for travellers given rising international travel, given rising international travel. For travellers who spend less than 48 hours outside Singapore, the value of goods brought overseas that can enjoy GST relief will be reduced from $150 to $100. For travellers who spend 48 hours or more outside Singapore, the relief quantum will be reduced from $600 to $500. This will take effect from tomorrow. I will also tighten the alcohol duty-free concessions for travellers from 3 litres to 2 litres. This will take effect from 1st April 2019. As I announced at the previous budget, we will raise GST by two percentage points sometime in the period from 2021 to 2025. When we raise GST, we will ensure that our overall system of taxes and transfers remains progressive and fair. We will continue to absorb GST on publicly subsidised education and health care. We will provide more help to lower-income households and the elderly by enhancing the permanent GST voucher scheme. We also cushioned the impact of the GST increase for a period through a GST offset package. Lower and middle-income households will get more, and more details will be announced later. Notwithstanding the need to raise revenues in the future, at the core of our fiscal system is our commitment to keep the overall tax burden low. We want workers and firms to keep as much as possible of what they earn. This leaves our citizens free to choose how they spend, save, or invest. Our main indirect tax, the GST, is not high by international standards, even after the planned increase to 9%. The OECD average is 19%. Among Asia-Pacific countries, many have standard GST rates that exceed 9%. Ultimately, a competitive tax regime helps us to attract and retain investments and talents. This, in turn, helps to bring in good jobs for Singaporeans. A competitive tax regime is a key anchor to our economic growth and the best way to sustainably increase tax revenues. I will extend and strengthen tax incentives to enhance our business competitiveness. At the same time, I will make some adjustments to further enhance the progressivity and resilience of our tax system. The details of these changes are in the Annex. The government will continue to plan ahead for the long term. 
My commitment to Singaporeans is that our overall taxes and transfer system will always remain fair, progressive and pro-growth. Let me now summarise our overall budget position. For financial year 2018, we expect an overall budget surplus of $2.1 billion or 0.4% of GDP. This is $2.7 billion increase from the 0.6% 0.6 billion dollars deficit forecasted a year ago. <clears throat> this was due to the unexpected two-year suspension of the Kuala Lumpur Singapore high-speed rail project and higher than expected stamp duty collections. When we exclude the government's top-ups to funds and net investment returns contribution from past reserves, we expect a basic deficit of $7 billion, or 1.4% of GDP. Financial year 2018 was hence an expansionary budget. For 2019, our budget position remains expansionary with a basic deficit of $7.1 billion. Ministry's total expenditures are expected to be $80.3 billion, 1.6% higher than in financial year 2018. We are setting aside funds to meet Singaporeans' long-term needs, including $6.1 billion for the Medica Generation Package and $5.1 billion for long-term care support. On the whole, we expect an overall budget deficit of $3.5 billion, or 0.7% of GDP. We have sufficient fiscal surplus accumulated over this term of government to fund the overall deficit in financial year 2019. There is no draw on past reserves. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, sir, I will now conclude. First, I'd like to thank the many Singaporeans, as well as businesses, unions, charities, and community organizations who have provided your feedback and ideas. And special thanks to the talented students from Nanyang Polytechnic for the beautiful sketches that you see in my slides today. <laughs> we commemorate 2019, our bicentennial year, to learn from our past in order to chart our future. <clears throat> we'll have many opportunities to reflect and share in the coming months and years. But three lessons stand out for me and my colleagues. First, for as long as we stay relevant and useful, Singapore and Singaporeans will have our place in the world. We must develop deep capabilities, stay open and connected, and draw ideas and talents from around the globe. Singaporean talents have been making their mark in various fields and connecting with other highly skilled individuals from around the world will make our team even stronger. Second, external events around us will shape and reshape our lives. Our people have shown time and again that we can take the long view, adapt with the times, and thrive. Third, we'll draw strength from our diversity by focusing on what we have in common. In the earlier years, our forefathers clustered around ethnic and religious groups to support one another. Today, Singaporeans support one another, regardless of race, language, or religion. Budget 2019 draws on these key lessons. We build on our multicultural heritage to foster a caring and inclusive society. We continue to nurture our young and develop our people on a lifelong basis. We seek to take better care of our seniors so that they can stay active and healthy. We will partner businesses and workers to transform our economy we welcome the best MNCs and SMEs from around the world and help our startups and SMEs to grow, scale, and internationalize. We'll help our workers deepen their capabilities and seek new opportunities. To catch the wave of the fourth industrial revolution, we are positioning Singapore as a global Asia node of technology, innovation, and enterprise. The changes ahead will be faster and deeper. Budget 2019 highlights the key challenges we are facing 
and how we are preparing to ride on the changes, to turn challenges into opportunities for Singaporeans and for our partners in the global community. We are investing to keep Singapore safe and secure. We are restructuring our economy to enable our businesses and workers to thrive. We are building a more caring and inclusive society. We are building Singapore as a global home, as a global city and home for all. Even as we invest more, Budget 2019 maintains our fiscal discipline. Our institution of the elected president and the Council of Presidential Advisers ensure that the government of the day does not squander the reserves our forefathers have left for us. The government will ensure that we abide by this. We must not only take care of this generation, but our children and their children. It is a core value we must uphold. Budget 2019 lays out this government's approach to build a strong, united Singapore. We nurture our young, take care of our seniors, expand opportunities for our people to be at their best, and to live in a livable, enduring home, secure and globally connected. Together, in close partnership with all, in our public, people and private sectors, we can and will continue to take Singapore forward. Mr. Speaker, sir, I beg to move.